it was amazing. Thank you. I love the worship service. I love great singing. Um, and thank you for your practice and hard work. I love it. Um, I have a mother who plays piano, and I realize how much you do practice and how much it is a, it seriously is a ministry, and it's all its own, so I appreciate you. Um, <laughs> I don't know where to begin, but the two-hour drive here, I pray. I try to make sure that my heart's in the right place. And uh, last service, we talked about Judas Iscariot and Peter. Two disciples, right? There's also James and lots of the other ones. And um, as I'm studying and I'm working on some of my other stuff, I'm coming across things that are challenging even for me. Um, and I ordered a book. Uh, it's actually from Rose Publishing about the end times and prophecy. This is hard for everybody because if we believe Christ came first of all, right? We know for sure Christ is here. There's history that proves it. But prophecy, as it goes in the future, is even harder, right? And there's some intangible things that we just trust that God's going to take care of it, right? But in this book, in the first couple pages, when I start realizing about the disciples and what they're doing, and um, a few weeks ago, um, we talked about the disciples were always searching for Christ's understanding and wisdom. Um, and I'll read this first just because it applies to so many things when we do in the Bible in the first introductory page. Tell us, the disciples asked, after the master predicted a future calamity in the city of Jerusalem, when will this happen and what will the sign of your coming at the end age, end of the age? In Matthew 24, 3, even after the death of the resurrection of Jesus, his followers found themselves with at least a few unanswered quer queries about the end of the world as they knew it. Gathered on the Mount of Olives, the, disciple questioned, the disciples questioned Jesus about how and when he would consummate his kingdom. Lord, they wondered, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Acts 1, 6. So they're curious, right? And this also reminds me of this. That's the end times, right? But I'm also reminded of when they say, Lord, how are we supposed to pray? And we say, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, how we pray, right? So the disciples were qu questioning Christ all the time to learn about Christ-like faith and where they go from here. Of that, you also have this, because we have the Word of God in our hands, right? Um, there's things that when I was studying the Word of God, I started doing this. Um, the Word of God, when you read it, is one thing. It's literal, it's historical, it's factual, it's spiritual, and it also has prophecy in it. But it all blends together like this. It saturates itself with each other, especially because you're talking about 12 disciples telling stories written down in the Word of God, like a big book report. 66 books, all in a big book report. But there's the Old Testament and the New Testament. When the disciples are talking, they're literally talking about the testimonies of Christ to begin with. All that being said, there's two common and opposite errors when we're studying in general. One of them, we tend to slip into unwarranted speculation. Unwarranted speculation. To slip into this rut is unwarranted speculation, and guesswork results in the desire to wring out more details from the data of Scripture, and Scripture is clearly provided. So what we're trying to do sometimes is we're trying to make sense of some of the things in the Bible, and we start sticking in extra stuff. <laughs> I justify some of my sin with some of that extra stuff, too. But the whole idea is we start slipping that in. We also have the idea of this. As we're studying the Word of God, um, we're not going to study the end, the end times right now, but it started my mind thinking about how many times that not only do I slip in the extra stuff, right, but I also do this. I just don't know. So I don't take the time to research, so I do a little sh shoulder shrugging. I don't really know, but I think this is the right direction. And that's what got me on the path that we were already talking about last week. <laughs> oh, Peter, I skipped some fun stuff along the way. Peter walked on water. You guys didn't know that, right? No one knew that, right? Peter walked on water. And there's several times in the Gospels we start talking about the different stories. And I actually read one of the parts where Peter slices the ear off of someone, right? But in other Gospels, it doesn't list Peter as the actual person who does it. But there is the gospel, as I said last week, that did it. So we have these documentations of it. So just for the encouragement and the fun part of this, of the fact that I love 
the story and the miracles of walking on water. Just kind of a cool thought to begin with. So as we start just the introduction and start doing this, um, let's open in a word of prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, King of all kings, my Lord Jesus Christ, Savior of men and my friend, you are an awesome God. Thank you for the many blessings you've already given us. Thank you for our health, our uh, traveling mercies just to get here. Lord, thank you for our friendship, our fellowship, our family membership here, that we do feel like a family in the body of Christ. We ask you lead us, guide us, direct us, come down from heaven above as the Holy Spirit moves in our heart to touch our hearts, our lives, and our minds, to wake our souls, that we can see you clearly and understand you better each day. We ask all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. I have got to read this just because I enjoy it. Sometimes I read it, sometimes I get to the begats, and I understand the lineage of Christ as the timeline goes. The reason they do it isn't because they say, on July 5th, which by the way, thank you so much for my birthday party, July 5th, 1972, I had a birthday. We don't list those things in the Bible of the way that someone was born. It's not a date and a time. It's usually by kings, and they report there by their lineage and their children who have generations, so they have generational time. And so sometimes I get caught up in that, and it's just, I almost want to fall asleep because I don't know how to pronounce some of the names sometimes. And then because I get lost in that idea, it's not as enjoyable. But then I get to things like this, where I'm like, whoa, this is kind of cool. So we're going to start in Matthew uh, 14, verse 22. Before somebody steals that car. Matthew 14, 22. And straightway Jesus, actually let's back up one step. Last week we realized that... Um, Christ, after going through the testing in the desert, then he goes to the Sea of Galilee, and that's where he meets Peter and Andrew and asks him to come with, drop your nets and come with us, right? But he's also on the way because of he had heard John was imprisoned. But in this verse, we actually know in verse 10, 14 verse 10, that, had, um, that Herod, the Tetrarch, actually has beheaded, verse 10, and he sent out and beheaded John in the prison. We also know that the disciples are also aware of the five fishes, the five loaves and two, two fishes. That the, he fed the multitudes. And that's where we come into the story because we're trying to get the timeline of what Christ is doing and where he's at. But Christ goes ahead and sends the disciples out. So Christ is actually alone and sends them on a ship. And that's where we begin this story. And the enjoyable part of the story, which the Bible is always enjoyable, um, but sometimes it's more enjoyable when I understand it and I see it clearly. And straightway Jesus, this is verse 22, chapter 14, Matthew. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray. And when, he, when the evening was come, he was there alone. I do want to pause and say this. I've talked about this before. Even Christ, even Christ, need to spend time alone with his God, our Heavenly Father. He is God, right? But he still spent time alone. And sometimes when we're alone, and we feel lonely. We're not alone. We have the Holy Spirit with us. Now in this case, God is, Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit. And until he's crucified, we don't actually get the Holy Spirit as we think of it today. And we'll get into that a little later. But the whole idea is, he is alone. And he's praying. Verse 24. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch... Of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Anybody know what the fourth watch is? You guys familiar with that at all? The fourth watch is the middle of the night. So 
they have watch times for each time, like soldiers would do this. That the, you know what? You get first watch, second watch, third night, fourth watch the last time. And I actually looked it up. It's usually about 3 a.m. to 6 o'clock in the morning. It's the darkest part of the night. The darkest part of the night. That's when he shows up. Not only does he show up, he shows up during the storm. Whoa, wait a minute. He's just showing up, right? The fourth watch. Christ in his almighty power and God Almighty could show up whenever he wants, but it's always the right time. We talked about the woman at the well and him sitting there on the sixth hour, right? Whether he was waiting or whatever it might be, right? He was doing other things, but it was the right time. The fourth hour. Don't you kind of like the idea? The darkest of the night, he's going to show up. I'm reminded of just an insert that we think of Christ on the right hand of God, sit it on the right hand of God. There's only one time he's mentioned in the Bible standing by God, and that's when Stephen gets stoned. Wouldn't you like to know when everything goes wrong, Christ stood up? And in this case, the fourth hour, here comes my Savior. We should be smiling about now, right? The fourth watch. The man's going to walk on water. We know the story, and I'm going to prove it to you because the Bible says so. Fourth hour. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. First of all, can I get just the north-south? The man did walk on water, correct? It wasn't just made up as a story. The man, Jesus Christ, walked on water, God Almighty. And when the disciples saw him walked on the, walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go see Jesus, to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Wow. First of all, it's kind of cool that originally Peter dropped his nets and comes running after Christ because he believes in the Messiah. He now gets tested again and says, you're Christ. I know you are, but I'm going to ask permission before I go out there. The Lord gives him permission and he believes and he starts heading that way. He goes to where Christ is. He sees Christ. He's walking towards him. How in the world does he start to sink? Same reason I sink in my own life and my own sins. I took my eyes off God. Jesus Christ Almighty, and so many times, so many times, even the little things I do in life, when I start thinking about what's in it for me, someone else, or the angles of my life might pursue, or what's going to happen when I say, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine understanding. I'm not trusting God. A disciple who knew the Messiah and was called by name, drop your nets and come out. Sure enough, takes his eyes off Christ and begins to sink and says, save me. We've talked about the whole idea that I love salvation and the fact that he has died for me. We know that Christ has died for us. I'm thankful I'm saved. But the peace that passes all understanding in the moments after I have been saved, I keep taking my mind, my eyes, my life, my spirit, my obsessions off Christ. And what do you think happens? I start sinking. Not only will I'm going to sink, I'm afraid I'm going to die. I can swim like a fish. I was a lifeguard. I can swim like a fish. But I'm sure in a contrary wind in the sea, out of a boat, there was a little fear in Peter's eyes. Because once he took his eyes off, what do you do? You start looking around to see, how can I save myself and do it in a fleshly manner? I can swim. I can tread water. Get me a piece of wood, I'll float, whatever it might be. He's going to try doing it himself, right? But he says, Lord, he knew where to look back again. 
Sure enough, what does he do? Verse 30. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. Lord, can you save me from this boisterous wind? I know you can walk on water, but the rest of this stuff, it's getting a little difficult. How big is your God, right? And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, where didst thou doubt? Thou of little faith. First of all, he did have a little faith. Peter's a better man than I, by the way. <laughs> Many of you are. Walking by faith alone. He got out of the boat. I'm not getting out of the boat. It's storming out. I love you, Lord. But oh, by the way, I would love to hang out with you when you get to the ship. Go ahead. Walk a little faster, Lord. I can't wait to see you. But I'm not getting out of the boat. Some of you might be better. I can't get out of that boat. It is a scary thing. If I knew him intimately like I say I do, and the friend my Lord Jesus Christ, I'm getting out of the boat. Peter is a passionate man. And I love him as a disciple because he reminds me so much of myself. I'm a passionate human being. But I'm not sure I'm getting out of the boat. Where did you doubt? And when they were come into the ship and the wind ceased, it's kind of nice that suddenly he's here, the wind ceased. He came on the fourth watch, the middle of the night, showed me he can walk on water. He's proven it over and over. I sink, he gets on the boat, the wind ceases. That should be enough just to believe alone, right? That should be enough. I've never seen that kind of miracles in my lifetime. I've seen some wonderful things that I don't, can't say the words that's unbelievable anymore. I don't think that should be a statement any human being should ever say because there's lots of human beings that say that. But because I know God Almighty, there's nothing I wouldn't believe. Some things surprise me, but. And they were going to come to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they, they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying of the truth, Thou art the Son of God. Now that being said, when it says, they that were in the ship, they're not just talking about the disciples. They're talking about everybody in that ship. You think it was just the disciples. Because, you know, a few of them are fishermen who might be able to control the boat. But there must have been a bigger boat because not just 12. There's more than that on a boat. But all of them said, Thou art the Son of God. That was fun. That was fun, right? The man walked on water. Somebody smile. The, the man walked on water. What more do you want? So then I started thinking this. We've learned about what Peter has been through. Judas Iscariot with him. We learned a couple of weeks ago about James, his half-brother, who didn't even believe that he's the Messiah, and writes the book of James later, right? We understand that Paul, who persecuted Christians all this time, he also, being of faith, right? They start writing the epistles, and the, what they do, and that's where I begin. We're going to turn to 1 Peter. Boy, it's good to be in the house of God. We're going to turn to 1 Peter. So first of all, these epistles, and I just named them, from Peter, James, Paul, um, Timothy being the um, student of Paul. They write these epistles to these churches because once Christ is crucified, remember all the story last week about Peter, where he literally was afraid again, just like the water and he sinks, right? He says, I seriously am never going to deny you Christ. I'm never going to do it. And yet does it three times before the cock crows. We already know this, right? And then we realize the unconditional faith that is required and then they start turning full circle where Peter runs, runs, because he heard Christ rose from the dead. He gets there. He sees the fold of linens, that type of thing. And then Christ appears later. Christ also appears to his half-brother. And that's where you start seeing not only is this an amazing man, he is truly the Messiah and the Savior of the world. Now, the persecution that is faced now that Peter is literally afraid, and that's why he was denying him, because he's afraid he's going to die, right? But all the Christians are going through this now. The Israelites, they're scattered abroad. That's what it says in James. But in 1 Peter, it talks about this, and we'll just read the first, so we get the historical background of the Bible too. 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, 
to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elected according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So they're scattered abroad. It's actually important that even that we know in the Bible that Peter is an apostle. But in order to be an apostle, you'd have to see Christ Almighty and be called according to his purpose. And literally, he was asked to come and leave his nets, right? The reason I'm saying that is because when you're talking about, this is five, five regions of Asia. Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. We have to understand that the translation that God literally protects his word of God and has done it all through history. If Peter's the disciple, and he is, and been near Christ, this book is written 66 AD-ish, right? So Christ lived 33 years, crucified after death, right, AD, right? About 66 AD. What we understand is that this was physically written, but it's written in a letter. And if you got handed as if it was the Word of God and the only copy in China and some of the countries that are communist countries now, they cherish the Word of God because at any time it can be taken from you. Now I think about that in today's history, right? But, but what about then? You think it wasn't any different? They're being persecuted and he's witnessing to five regions. And actually, it is the Word of God. He wrote the letter, right? But we, it is the Word of God. It is inspired by Him. And in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is inspired by God and protected by Him, right? So that's why I'm saying that, because that's the way it's written. That's the way we understand it. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. They're being persecuted. By the third verse, we're already talking about your hope. Remember he fell in the water, looked up, Christ's hope, reaches out his hand. Reaches out his hand, pulls him out of the water. We're all talking about making sure that we are fulfilling the Great Commission. In the last part of Matthew, when we're talking about this, and John, when we're talking about he sends them out. First in Jerusalem into all the other. That's what they're doing. And that's what Peter's doing into these five regions and the scattered abroad. To the inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled. This is verse 4. And that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. To the inheritance. I want to compare this epistle with the James one in just a minute. Um, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need, ye are in heaviness through the manifold of temptations. Imagine that, temptations even then. That the trial of your faith, the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. There are rewards for enduring temptation. When I turn back just to James, the chapter before, um, if you have your phone, swipe left, swipe right. Um, so these disciples, these Christian men who know our Savior, right? And we see the saturation. Remember the whole thing that it all blends together, right? In James chapter 1, we see James, a servant of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. We should have joy when we're being tested and tried. I don't like it. <laughs> it's hard, right? But it makes you a better Christian and makes you a stronger Christian. And the Christians who haven't been tested aren't the ones who aren't praying for you at night. I can promise you that. The Christians who haven't been tempted or the young Christians... You say, I love them dearly. But they're still growing in their faith. But the Christians who have been truly tested, in this case persecuted, those are kind of the ones that, you know, God does this as a, it's special 
You are special when you're tested and tried. God loves you. That's why God, like our Heavenly Father, or me as a foster care parent, says, Hey, teenage, get out of the street. You're going to get hit by a car. Don't smoke. Don't vape. Don't do drugs. Oh, by the way, that person is not right for your life. Oh, by the way, those friends are going to get you in trouble. How different is the Lord Almighty to do that, right? From our financial decisions to our physical decisions, from our spiritual decisions, God Almighty does the same thing. And by testing us, he's teaching us a lesson that we can give to others. Knowing this, that trying of your faith worketh patience. That's a whole different sermon for a different week. But let patience have his perfect work, have her perfect work, and that may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, ask of God that giveth unto all men liberally, unbraideth not, and it be shall given to him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for that for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. For let not the man, that man, think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he be exalted. But the rich in that he is made low, because of the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen a burning heat, but is withereth the grass, and the flower thereof fa falleth. And the grace of the fashion of it perish, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. In verse 12 and 13, we get through all of that, right? There's a lot of lessons to be just grasped and fed on. But we're talking about so many things, even the rich man, or the temptations. Blessed is the man, in verse 12, that endureth temptation, for he, when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for he cannot be tempted with the devil, neither tempteth he any man. So we're going to flip back to 1 Peter again. When we get to verse 7, we understand the trying or pace is like gold, right? But we also understand in verse 4 where it says, To an inheritance uncorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Anybody in this room believe in spiritual things? Because we just got told there's treasure in heaven. Anybody believe that Jesus didn't walk on water? We still have to believe it from the past, right? And we're documenting it from somebody else's word. And now we're talking about the word of God, which, by the way, the word represents Christ Almighty to begin with. It's an amazing thing that we have two separate books of the Bible and the New Testament that relate so much to each other. Now, we are tested by our faith, but there's also treasure for it. That means I have to give up my Girl Scout cookies, live healthier, be a better witness. Maybe there's treasure in heaven for it, right? I just inserted the word maybe. No, that's what it says. It might be sugar cookies, and there might be weights for it, and there might be this or that. But I do know this. Like Peter walking in the water, if I keep my eyes on God, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine understanding, there will be treasure in heaven. There is a place for me in heaven. Which, by the way, the second coming that we're talking about to begin with, and all the entire Bible about the gospel that we believe in him to begin with. But why don't we believe the other things? Because we don't always fear him. And that's where we're going next. The apostleship of, of Peter, he's talking to elect Christians, and he's also talking about this. Um, verse 8, 1 Peter. Whom have, having not seen ye love, in whom thou, though, now see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice, and joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now remember, he's talking about Christians in five different regions who have not seen Christ themselves. Although, because he's writing it, that's why it's so important. In the very beginning, he says, I'm an apostle, I've seen Christ, These are, this is what I need to tell you. So he's giving factually a letter the Bible, to the new Christians. Receiving the end of your faith, um, 
and of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, prophesied of your grace, that should come unto you. Searching what? Searching or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it is testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. The angels don't have the Holy Ghost. They're creatures created by God. And so that's a whole doctrine in itself. But, the, but with Peter trying to understand and give hope of Christ Almighty, we now have hope. And when we're suffering, we have the trials and tribulations that just know I'm getting tried. But we also heard the part about James where we're not tried by God. Satan is allowed to do certain things in order for us to resist the devil and grow stronger in the Lord. But our hope remains in the Lord, and that's where you got to look on. Peter needs to look up at Christ. Water. Wherefore, gird up your loins, your mind be sober, and hope to the end for grace that is, be, that is to be brought up unto you at revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. Verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to former lust and ignorance. I don't know about you, but when I got saved, I didn't forget how to sin. I didn't suddenly say, Mom, Dad, I didn't do it. Nobody did it. My brother did it. I didn't suddenly forget that. I knew how to do it. You think these Christians who are being tested and tried, and even Peter, who said, I don't know, God, Jesus who? Three times, right? North, south, three times, right? Even Peter did the same thing. All because you're a Christian doesn't mean you forgot how to sin. But we have to resist those trials and temptations because the work of it is better and more precious than gold, right? That, that's what we're trying to do. But we don't need to forget that we are asked to be obedient. And that's where the next part comes into, where we start realizing the Holy Ghost being sent down from heaven, and even the angels don't understand how special we are and still protect us. Verse 15, But as he which hath called you is holy, so ye be holy in the manner of conversation. Just in conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect to persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Here in fear. Reverence to God Almighty the sojourning, the understanding that true respect of and right? That if God, who calmed the sea when he got in the boat, he's the one who walked on water. He's that powerful. And when you start realizing he created the heavens and the earth, how dare I decide to myself, I haven't forgotten how to sin. But oh, by the way, I have the luxury of grace. How many of us in our own families have yelled at a family member because I just know they would forgive me? I'm tired. So many times I treat the guys I work with, I'm tired, I am ready to go. My body is absolutely tired. I'll get me a Gatorade. It's been hot this week. But I still talk to the people I work with better than I go home and talk to my family. Let that sink in. Why do we do that? Because we think our family's going to understand. Our husband, our wife, is going to understand. They love me. They're going to understand I'm tired, so I just let down. 
We don't take that extra amount of effort to say, sweetheart, I love you. Honey, I love you. And what do we do to our Heavenly Father? Whose stripes were healed by it. The man died on the cross, was hit with a cat of nine tails, embarrassed, mocked, his beard plucked. He is basically tortured on a cross and dies for us. The same man who walked on water who could have called 10,000 angels died on the cross for us and I don't have the reverence enough to say I don't think I'm going to lie today to my parents as a teenager, right? Because we do this to ourselves because it's easier. And we also know if you're truly saved, our God will forgive us. Keep in mind, there is a consequence for your sin. No matter what that sin is, there's always a consequence. Sin's like a credit card. Enjoy now, pay later. Boy, I enjoyed spending that money, though. Don't you get it wrong. In case you've never sinned, sometimes that sin's enjoyable. But there's always a consequence, and you always got to pay the debt later. In this case, being indebted to the Heavenly Father, who gave us His Son, should be a sobering thought. Peter tells us that. Sojourning here in fear, for as much, this is verse 18, for as much ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, and your vain conversation received by traditions from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Let's just read that one again. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Did you guys get that? Or did it go over your heads? Like mine. Before, the found, before he created the world, God Almighty said, you know what? I'm going to send my... He already had a plan. Everything works together for good, for then there are called according to his purpose. By the way, good according to his purpose. Right? In order to have salvation, we have to accept it. But there is a plan. All we have to do is accept it. Foreordained before the beginning of the world, who by him do believe in God and raised him up from the dead and gave him the glory that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Remember the part where he added two commandments where he said, of all these things, the first thing is love me. The second one is love thy neighbor as thyself. You see it again? The saturation of the word of God. It's not just one book of the Bible. It's all the books of the Bible. It's from foreordained. It's Genesis. Before God created the planet alone and separated the heavens and the earth, he came up with a plan because he knew man would sin. He also knew all your sins. He knew James Noggle before I came here, before I actually was born. He knew I was going to sin. He knew Paul was going to do the crazy things he did. He knew Peter was going to deny him three times and yet gave his life for him. And I'm not deserving of one stripe on the Lord's back. I don't know about any of you guys, but if I decide to lie today, Don, you want to take a whooping for me? Is anybody in this room going to take a whooping for something I'm doing? And the man died on the cross for me. You're purifying your souls, obeying the truth through the Spirit, unfeigned love, that you love one another. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, 
We are only incorruptible by the word of God. Trusting him is what saves us. God does not see our sin because of Christ giving his life for us, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass, and grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Which, by the way, um, I'm just going to read this quick. Um, we were just talking about the word of God. Um, the word endureth forever. The gospel of John. In the beginning, the word was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In the beginning... The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him not anything was made. In him was life, and life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehendeth it not. When we get down here on verse 14 of the Gospel of John, the first chapter, and the Word, actually verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word, and the Word actually means Jesus, was made flesh. Made flesh being Jesus. Was dwelt with us. When I go back here and I start the, the part of Peter about the Word of God in verse 25. But the Word of, of the Lord endureth forever. Who do you think that's talking about? Christ Almighty. And this is the Word which by the Gospel is preached unto you. Wearing, for laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and the evils and envy, evil speakings. And this is the part that sometimes us as Christians struggle with the most. We just talked about the hypocrisy, we talked about our sin, but now we're talking about as a newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, of the word. We desire it, that he may grow thereby. If so, Ye have been taste, ta tasted that the Lord is gracious. So that's talking about the grace, right? Now God's showing you grace as a new Christian. Anybody in here been a new Christian? The problem with a new Christian and myself is way back when, or just a day or two ago, the way I thought is different than the way I think now. And actually, I remember how to sin a lot better when I was a first newborn Christian. But as I started getting a little more distant from that sin and the testing of our patience, of our, the testing of our faith, right, and being tried, that's the part that sometimes we don't get the picture of. I have been tested, which means I stepped further away. Some parts of my life are kind of stinky. The closer I am to that moment in time, I can still smell it, and it's the stench I don't want to be around. You ever notice when you start getting further away, it doesn't smell so bad. The further away I get, God's testing our faith, right? I can better endure the temptation by doing that. But of that, there's one other thing that we start to forget as Christians and what we do to each other as Christians. We talked last week about some things don't surprise me. The unchristians, the unsaved people who aren't Christians, it does not surprise me they lie, cheat, and steal and have an angle to try to make more money, try to do manipulative things, get with somebody else's spouse or otherwise. It does not surprise me that they steal a car or truck. It doesn't surprise me they do drugs or that the President of the United States cheated for an election. It doesn't surprise me if you are unsaved. What does surprise me is the way we treat each other in this very room. I love you all. But occasionally, I might not do the exact right thing by you. Now, some of it, if I don't, I'm not ever doing it intentionally, right? And if my heart's right, I'm not doing it at all. But occasionally, out of my laziness, because you're family, you're going to forgive me, and I have to abstain from that. But the further I get from it, as a new Christian, it starts to get less smelly. I don't get in the same habits. I don't do the same things. I treat the people around me better, if not the right way to begin with. And especially my fellow, my fellow brethren of Christ. What I didn't realize is this. Well, not that I didn't realize it. I put a little thought into it that um, when we're a new Christian, we, we start realizing that 
we're not as thankful for everything in our lives. We're not as thankful financially, physically, and spiritually for everything. God gave it to you. But as a new Christian, I don't really realize the power of God and that he really could walk on water. I start realizing the stories and I start getting a grip of it, but I don't realize that. But I also don't realize things like this. I celebrated Halloween when I first got saved. I still understand children in the room. Close your ears. There's no Santa Claus. But as a Christian, I start realizing when I raise my own kids, I love the fantasy of it. I love the holidays. And I might tell them fun stories, but they have to be a very specific nature of this is the fantasy world and this is the dream. And this, I'm telling you a story, a fictitious story. The real story is Christ was born on that day. A mature Christian starts to understand that there's certain things I just don't do anymore. There's certain things I just am not going to be do. I'm not going to, I'm going to err on the side of caution and not do. And that's what we're talking about. The revealing of Christ for other Christians might be different from one Christian to the next. Stick with me for a second. This is important. Because the way I see things in my part of my spiritual journey are slightly different at this very moment in time because I'm standing further away from my smell than I was a moment ago, a year ago, ten years ago. Why am I going to judge the young Christian who is still standing by the smell? They don't realize it. And if I tell them the stories and I share my experiences, that's one thing. But there's absolutely no reason for this. Stick with me. Do not lose fellowship one with another because the young Christian is different than the mature Christian. I hope that I've taught that young Christian that they can come appro be approachable. That the best thing you can do, the Christians in this room that have served the Lord the longest, make yourself approachable. It's hard enough. Actually, I was talking to someone recently about the invitation alone. It's hard enough to come forward in front of God Almighty. But you're also being judged and the things you're stepping out for are different. Why aren't we more approachable? Especially to the family and friends and other Christians. We're not talking about just the unsaved. We're talking about our fellow brother in Christ. And I'm sure this church, along with many others, have had some hard times where people have removed themselves from your life. And we have to forgive them. I have a forgiveness journal where I do the same thing. But our Christian brothers in Christ, that might be a immature Christian, a new Christian, or the mature Christian. At what point in time do I become a mature Christian? It might take me a lot longer. In case you didn't realize this, everybody in the room, it's taken me 30 years to try to graduate from Bible college. I am a slow learner. I get straight A's. But my experiences say otherwise because I'm a slow learner. How long it takes me to get to that destination, destination is part of my journey, and it's all part of God's purpose. We go back. The mature Christian. As we see this, the babes in Christ, um, the milk, the sincere milk of the word, that we grow thereby. We live lively in the spiritual house, a holy priesthood. There, verse 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. That's prayers. Spiritual sacrifices, right? And the priesthood of the believer, which is a little bit of Bible college knowledge. If you've heard of the priesthood of the believer, this is where Catholics and other faiths dif differ from what we believe. The priesthood of the believer says this. When I read the Word of God, it is simple enough that it says he walked on water. What do you think happened? He walked on water. Catholics, and the reason it's called the Protestant faith is protest. The first word, protest. So they were literally moving away because the Catholic Church, because the Bible was actually translated from Greek, Hebrew, Latin, the, the Aramaic, right? There, there are three different languages that we're learning from and they translate it. But the Catholic Church, before the Bible was translated into the English, the English language as we know it now, with the, William, uh, with the Gutenberg Bible being reprinted, right? We go back through all of that, we realize this. 
Catholics told us what we were supposed to believe. A religion telling us what we're supposed to believe. If I'm in this church, which we are, right, and I'm telling you what you're supposed to believe, that's one thing, but now how do you prove it? The sole authority of the Word of God. The sole authority, which means the priest of the believer says this. If you read this, you'll get the same answer I got. That's the priest of the believer. And that's what Peter's talking about when you're talking about the whole idea that when you read and the priesthood of the believer, God speaks to us. The Holy Spirit works in us. Where other religions aren't always that way, they're trying to tell you what you're supposed to believe, then you get in the same thing, it's not quite that way. Um, verse 6, Wherefore also is uh, contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion the chief comer of stone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Confused, right? Because you're believing on him. You're trusting in God. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them that which be disobedient, the stone which the builders... Corner. Build your life on a foundation that's not of the word of God. Your life is not going to be stable. It's not going to be built on a firm foundation. And the stone stumbling... And the rock of offense, even to them that would stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are the chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of the darkness into marvelous light. Remember the Gospel of John? Separates the darkness and the light. What separates is the word of God. Because Christ is the word of God which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which hath been obtained mercy, now have been, a, but now have obtained mercy. Sorry. Which had not obtained mercy, have now obtained mercy because of the word of God. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstained from le fleshly lust, which war against your soul. There is a war against your soul fleshly lust. We did not forget how to sin all because we got saved. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles that, they're, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers that they may be by your good works which they shall behold glorify in God the day of salvation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether it be to the king as supreme. I'm reading too fast again. I hope you will register it. That's why I want to make sure you turn to it. God tells us we need to follow the rules of men. So if we're living in the United States, right, there, there's something called the Muslims have a different spiritual law, which because it's spiritual law, they don't have to honor that country's law. Shakira law. Uh, sh shock, anyway, the point being is, when you're talking about, I um, forgot the word, but um, yeah, that's it. Um, it's a different law, but they believe because of their religious beliefs, they don't have to do that. And the Bible tells us, especially when we're talking about a Christian country, and I say that loosely, we still have a country that we can serve God Almighty and have a church. There are some countries that aren't like that. And by the way, the downfall of our nation isn't always because of our leaders. We blame it on them. That's the easy thing. But it's because of our, the way we parent and our churches and the way we present our Christian faith. If we're not doing that enough to everybody, it's our own responsibility to make sure that we're doing that and witnessing. And actually, I'm reminded of this. There's some people today who do not wish to accept responsibility. They blame society they blame the environment. They blame schools. They blame circumstances. Adam sinned in a perfect environment under perfect circumstances. We can't blame our sin on someone else. The big finish. Closing of this. Verse 24, as we just go down here. and Who did no sin, neither was... 
God for him. Um, verse 21. For even un- here unto, here, where, unto where ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Verse 24. Who has our own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, but whose stripes by whose stripes ye are healed. For ye are as sheep going astray, but now returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. We talked about whose stripes you're healed. I, I'm not, Don's not taking a whooping for me. You already found that out, right? Um, but Christ did that for me. A man who knew no sin. You guys ever been on a diet or fasting, and somebody else is eating things, right? And you realize, oh my, I'd really like to enjoy that. You think that didn't occur to Christ? You think that when the devil tempted him with any way possible to sin, that it didn't affect him, right? And not a single person in this room, I hope, would take a beating in order to me to sin. Even our children do it to us all the time where we think, you're breaking my heart, son. Daughter, you're breaking my heart. And yet, what am I going to do? We, we sacrifice some things for them because they're our children, right? But I'm a stranger to Jesus Christ. And yet, he calls me friend. He calls me friend. He calls me friend. He died for our sins. He's the amazing man who literally walked on water, created this world, led these disciples and showed miracles to the multitudes who literally, Pontius Pilate, allowed Barabbas, a murderer to be set free so that the Pharisees and the scribes could crucify our Lord God. And then we realize this. It was all part of God's plan before the foundations of the world. And yet Christ, being as human, said, if this cup can be taken from me, Lord, Please, don't make me go through this. You think he wasn't hurt? You think we don't hurt him every time we sin? If we're not trying to be a better Christian each day and be a mature Christian, from the young Christian to the mature Christian, if we're not the mature Christian and being approachable, you're taking a step back too. Be approachable. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If any of you have not accepted Christ your personal Savior, I'll be approachable in any way, shape, or form. I will give you my phone number. Um, As I pray, I'm going to pray a little bit today. If you have a financial need, raise your hand so I can pray for you. If you have a spiritual need in your heart, Raise your hand so I can pray for you. I see you. Thank you. If you have a physical need, even if you can't sleep at night, raise your hand. Lots of us. Lots of us. Precious Lord, Savior, King of Kings, God Almighty, as we offer this invitation, God, we have needs. We have spiritual needs. We have financial needs. We want God to touch our hearts and understand, open, open our minds, our heart, and our spirit to the true word of God that you can touch us and bring us alive that we will know you as our friend, the Christ who died for us. Lord, the peace that passes all understanding, when I go to bed at night and I pray, Lord, I just pray and I give you my heart. I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. 
How do I trust you more? Is it my body, my flesh? Do I need to commune with you more? Lord, we need you. I need you when I get up in the morning, I just breathe. I need you when I go to bed at night. Lord, as I pray at night, that we can find rest. That I can think of things that are righteous and upright. Lord, I ask for your help in every way. Precious and Holy Spirit. Amen. Everyone stand. We're going to have a little, we're going to have another invitation, a little, play a little longer. If you want to, everybody stand. We're going to, if you want to pray, come forward. I'll close this on a word of prayer afterwards. Thank you for your, pay, your paying attention and enjoyment of the service. Our precious Lord and Savior, King of all kings, I am so thankful for your blessing you've given to this church and personally. Lord, you have asked me to pray a little longer today, and I'm thankful for it. Lord, we need your help. Please, divine intervention in each one of our lives that you've touched our spirits, our minds, our souls, that we might witness to others, that we might be approachable, that we might be mature Christians and understand without judging. Lord, thank you for the stories of the Bible, the history of the Bible, and the way it touches my soul. And every time I read it, it comes back to life again. Lord, I have friends in my life that need you, that need your salvation. I have friends in my life that need to get right with God. I have family members that need to see you clearly. Lord, we have financial needs Oh, Lord God, bless us. Bless us with seeing you. Seeing you in everything we do. Lord, you have been amazing. Awesome. It's amazing God who has died for me, died for each member of this church, died for the strangers that may not even have the word. Lord, allow us to pass the word this week. Allow us to do what's right. Allow us traveling mercies so we can see each other again soon. We ask all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, you are dismissed. It's been an absolute blessing.